This is BBC Radio 4. Now our afternoon play, a darkly romantic ghost story which offers a tantalising and sometimes uncomfortable glimpse of the street secrets offered up by old London town when you scratch beneath the surface. Gin and Rum by Philip Palmer It's fine. Hardly picnic weather, though. Walk around a bit. It'll soon warm up. What's that? Post office tower. No, no. The building there with the vents on the roof. It's a Catholic school. St Joseph's. They have a playground on the roof. That one there? Prudential building. Where's St Paul's Cathedral? That direction. Do you want a half my sandwich? I'll have half of yours. What's yours? Spinach and mozzarella. Yours? Cheese. Spread. Laughing cow. <laughs> it's your idea to share. Really cold. Go back in if you like. I get an hour, I take an hour. It's only management who choose to take short lunch breaks. Are you trying to get rid of me? Admit it, you're aching to get back to your desk. Oh, don't be so rude. It's written all over you. You feel silly for coming up on the roof. I just wanted to see the view. Well, there it is. And I could do without the sarcasm, thank you very much. Comes with the view. Where's the river? There. What's that red dot in the sky? Smithfields and Barts. St Paul's that way. What have we got? Coronation chicken. Try some? Mm, thanks. Post office tower. Easy, anyone can get that. Mm, nice chicken. That's Lincoln's Inn. The law court's behind. The clock, that's part of the City York pub. Um, <coughs> St Joseph's. <coughs> the Peabody Flats. Islington, that way. How am I doing? Good. That's the Prudential building, formerly the site of Furnival's Inn. What's the street running next to it? Leather Lane. Turn off down Gravel Street, you're in Hatton Garden. You should do the knowledge. Odd. A bit. Sorry. I always feel I should be more entertaining. No, no, not at all. Well, buildings are fascinating. Up to a point. Funny, though, we never talk about work. Work's boring. Your work is boring. Mine isn't. I'm head of an entire retail department. So, tell me about your work. Well, what is there to say? <laughs> it's all of my life. Apart from these lunch times. That's why you come up here, on the roof. It's time out. But still, we don't talk about work. You never go to the cinema. You have no telly, theatre. We talk about theatre. You talk about the plays you've read. Sheridan, Congreve, David Hare. You talk all the time. We have no conversation. All I do is listen. We're talking now. I'm grumbling. That's different. OK, we'll do it differently. What exactly are we doing? Pausing. I pause, then you pause, then... I pause again. <laughs> Is there a point to all of this? say democracy is a myth. An ideal. The ancient Greeks... They're a bunch of paedophile Nazis. ...invented democracy, but in fact, their system was more a form of oligarchy. Dictatorship. A ruling elite. Dictators! Chosen by merit, not by force of arms. Do you really believe that? Not entirely, but, but as an idea... It stinks. If you read Plato... I have. In the Greek... Oh, foul stroke. Come off it, Bob. Mad means shit, whatever the language. It's impossible to have a rational argument with you. That's because I interrupt you when you're talking crap. But you miss so much by not listening. And now you're trying to patronise me. Give it up, Bob. I've been patronised by really patronising people. Can't we just talk? Why do we always have to bicker? We don't. We do! Don't! Do! <laughs> you do see my point, though. Don't you? I see you're an elitist. Exactly. Oh, Bob! Yes, that's right. 
And over there, the Tower of London. You can't see the Tower of London. Yes, I can. Not from here. Yes, I can. Over there. I can't see a thing. You're not looking hard enough. I still can't see a thing. <laughs> this is a mind game, isn't it? Look hard enough and you can see it. I've never been to the Tower of London. Oh, no, you're taking the mickey. No, I'm not. Then you're a disgrace. You should be ashamed of yourself. Oh, I am. I am. I've been there many times. The first time when I was 17. We never went into the centre much when we were kids. My dad used to take us to the markets on Sundays. That was a day out, that was. I was doing my A-levels. I stayed all day. And hid when the yeoman warders came. <laughs> stayed all night as well. That was a mad thing to do. Oh, it was great. Really great. You must have been hungry. I packed sandwiches. <laughs> Pathetic, isn't it? Where did you hide? <laughs> there was a stairway in the Beecham Tower, shut off to the public. I pushed the door open and went up. There were no guards. All the security is in the Waterloo block where the crown jewels are kept. No one guards the old towers. Not inside. I couldn't go out, of course. I got claustrophobia pretty badly. I threw up on the paving flags. <laughs> it was the turning point of my life. Maybe we should have a visit, you and me, on Saturday. The only room I could get into was in the upper floor of the Beecham Tower, where the aristocrats were imprisoned. Sometimes for years. Sometimes for decades. The walls are covered in graffiti. Scrawls and carvings. Beautiful, beautiful carved stonework. The kind you'd expect to see in a, in a chapel or a cathedral choir, with the prisoners' names chiselled in their prison wall. Each of them saying, I was here. Every life was there. I could feel their breath, hear their voices. One prisoner carved the name of his jailer on the wall, Hugh Longworth, then killed him in an escape attempt. I heard you, Longworth, that day. I heard him. I felt him. We should go, maybe. Have a day trip. Maybe. noticed. I thought I might go away for the weekend. For the seaside, maybe. I don't feel like talking today. <sighs> Nor me. Sorry. Don't mean to be rude. You aren't being. Bob, for heaven's sake, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. You had no right to interfere. I just made a couple of calls. I'm happy where I am. You're wasted, overqualified. It's my life. Don't meddle with it. I was trying to be helpful, that's all. I know that, but I don't want a better job. OK, end of story. Whatever you say. Let's forget the fact you have a menial job and everyone in the office treats you like crap. You don't. Everyone but me. That's why I started being nice to you. You thought someone ought to. I just can't believe you don't want to do more with your life. It's a choice. My choice. I can live on very little. My rent is 30 quid a week, 20 quid a week on food, 10 quid a week into a clothes account for when I need a new suit. You live in poverty. It's absurd. Poverty is relative. But you have a degree. You have a PhD. So it's written in stone, is it? I have a degree, so I have to have a graduate income. Oh, I hate that sort of conventional thinking. Don't you make out you're a rebel. You're the most conventional person I've ever met. You're talking about fashion. That doesn't concern me. That's because you've got no sense of style. Brown suit, brown shoes. Black suit, black shoes. That's all I need to know. Tell me, how much is a copy of Time Out? Dunno. One pound ninety-five. How much is a pret a manger sandwich? Dunno, it depends. Mozzarella and spinach. You have one every week. Uh, Dunno. Two pound thirty-five. One pound ten for a takeaway cappuccino. That's where your money goes. How much do you need to live on a month? Stop interrogating me! I earn good money. I'll spend it how I like. For you, money is something that dribbles away. For me, it's controlled. I'm in charge. That's how I live my life. Broke. Monastic. A monastic discipline. You don't think you're romanticising this a little? You're an office clerk. I'm a man who has his life in perfect balance. Monastic. Don't scoff. Celibate too, I suppose. Oh, shit. Nearly 15 years now. Something wrong? I'm taken aback, that's all. Is this a religious thing? No, no. So why then? I just prefer it. Maybe you're not that highly sexed. 
some people aren't. No, that's not the reason. If you were highly sexed, you couldn't give it up. The opposite is true. For me, sex is all important. Women and men, slim, fat or skinny, young, middle-aged or old, everything gets me hot. I'm hot now. What do you mean? I mean, I'm hot now, sexually aroused. You mean... Oh, yes. Are you saying you want to make love to me? I want to, yes. You bastard, I could report you for that. Oh, damn. Sexual harassment. I was not... I, look, I was Walked not... Walked into that one. <sighs> OK, I'll let it go this time. I've screwed it up. But if you ever try that again... This was meant to be... I just wanted you as a, as a friend. I said I'll let it go. And now it's screwed up. End of friendship. Oh, I could kill myself. Hey, I steady on. Oh, I always thought of these lunch times as a sanctuary period when we can say anything to each other without fear of comeback. Look, I'm just saying back off a little. It, it's not a, a blowing your brains out issue. I'm so stupid. I was just... I would never, ever try to get you into bed. Bob, just shut up, OK? Let's just change the subject. Why? Why not? What? Why wouldn't you try to get me into bed? I'm sorry? Am I so awful? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, what a crass thing to say. I don't care if you don't fancy me. I do. I do fancy you. Desire you. I could love you if I let myself. Strangely enough, I don't mind you saying that. I do want to make love to you. I really do. That's cool. But I never will. I don't want the release. I'd rather bottle it up. Feel the hurt. That turns you on. Not doing it. Makes me high. That's new one on me. <laughs> You want to try it? How? It's quite safe. A game. A thought experiment. No touching. That's the rule. Oh, I'm going to regret this. I have a three o'clock meeting. It's only 1.45. What do I do? Say, I want you. I want you. You can't have me. Say, I want to kiss you. Touch you. Stroke you. I want to kiss you. Touch you. Stroke you. You can't. Say, I want to hold you in my arms. I want to crush my lips against yours, but I can't. Now you're getting the hang of it. I want to close my eyes and have you run your tongue and lips over my cheeks, my throat. I want you to kiss my eyelids. I want you to be so close I can feel the warmth of your breath. Go on. I want to see you naked. Then open your eyes. Very funny. I was only joking. Put your clothes back on. Bob! Bloody hell, someone might see! <laughs> Christ! <laughs> that was good. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, that was good. <laughs> thing about me is, um, I'm sorry, there isn't a most important thing about me. How do I play this game? I'll go first then. The most important thing about me is, I'm mad. Completely mad. Deliberately mad. This is good. You are such a show-off. But not organically mad. Not psychotic. Just slightly to the left of reality. Oh, come on, Bob. This is just bullshit. My subject. History. More specifically, History of London. More specifically, everything that happened in every street, every house, every alleyway. Who lived where and when. The names of their children, when they died and how. I could write a book. But the trouble is, it would be a million pages long. 
I could walk from St Paul's to Covent Garden and tell you something about every building we passed. Wow. Do you take bookings? Pick a century. I can describe it. 17th century. Peeps is London. Easy. Walk down the streets. Traders calling pancakes and dumplings, dumplings, diddle diddle dumplings. Oh, knives to grind, cucumbers to pickle, hot baked warden pears and pippins. I can see it as clearly as day, as clearly as I see you. I'm there now, on the street market, on the banks of the river by Fleet Bridge. I can see vicious looking men standing by barrows piled high with gingerbreads and nuts. I can see old hags offering the passing Londoners their nightcaps and plum pudding and firmity. I can see it all. Don't take this to heart, but you're on the cusp of being very boring. That's one view. I'm a train spotter, an anorak, but my special joy is. I know my world so well. I can live there just by closing my eyes. I have to go. Crazy hour is over. I close my eyes and I'm there. I can hear the voices, real people. People who lived, people who died. Uh, enough, Bob. The Gordon Riots, 1780. The London mob erupted. They broke into Langdale's distillery and set it alight. Hundreds of people risked their lives by running through the flames and fetching out pails and jugs and even pig troughs full of gin. The stills exploded and raw spirits poured into the street, into the gutters, mixing with gallons of rum from the smashed barrels. People lay down in the gutters and drank the liquid. It burned their throats like acid. It burns my throat too. You see my point? You have an over-vivid imagination. I know too much. And now I'm my own life's work. I want you to share it with me. This game isn't working for me. Close your eyes. And hear the mob. Listen to the mob. Listen to their screams of pain as the rum and gin mixture from the gutters burns their throats. You hear it? I hear it. You mean that? I hear it. I feel it. I can feel my throat burn. I can taste the rum and the gin. That's really spooky. Crisps. Mm. Thanks. I had a date last night. That's nice. Do you want to know his name? I'm happy to know. Jeff. Nice name. He works on accounts. <laughs> You're not serious. He's a senior manager. Mm. Nice night. Very nice. You're not seeing him again? Yes. You like him? Yes. He has a child and a nine-year-old. Jeff's devoted to him. Is this small talk? Yes. Verging on gossip, in fact. How am I doing? It's blood from a stone time, to be honest. But at least you're trying. Who gives a damn about what those idiots say or do? You shouldn't let them get to you. That's easy for you to say. You're good at your job. That's what counts. Not in this man's world, it isn't. Oh, you, I'm sure you're exaggerating. I'm not. I'm being passed over. I can feel it. Then say something. That'd make it worse. Then say nothing. Worse still. I don't know what to say. Don't patronise me. Hell, I'm sorry. I don't mean to take it out on you. No problem. That's what I'm here for. Sounding board. Whipping boy. You're the only person in the world who can't bully me. <laughs> Gee, thanks. The only person stranger than I am. You're not strange. Not compared to you. I'm mellowing. I don't want you to. I like you the way you are. No, no, you were right. What you said to me once. I should get out more. So I do. I went to the cinema last week. And? Tarkovsky. Loved it. The time went so fast. I couldn't believe it when the film ended. I have news for you, Bob. You're still strange. <laughs> Tell me about the ghosts. No. Please, Bob, please. I don't hear the ghosts anymore. Not recently, not since. Tell me about the ghosts. 
The trouble with knowing things is it grows and grows. I look at a building and I see its history, the men who built it, the people who lived there. I see the colours and clothes and periwigs. I hear voices. And the voices speak to me. They tell me things. Tell me about the voices. <sighs> There's a house in Lincoln's Inn Fields, near the John Soane Museum. A girl lived there. Her name was Joan Wybury. Her father raped her and she committed suicide. I know it's all true. I checked the historical records. But I knew it all before I read a word. She spoke to me, Judy. I saw her. I walked through Lincoln's Inn Fields and saw her ghost. And what did she say? She told me her name, her mother's name, her father's name, her sister's names. She told me her age, the names of her friends. She told me her father had raped her and where. She told me the name of the poison she bought. She told me the room she was in the day she drank it, the colours of the walls. It was raining outside. It was a Wednesday. She told me all the facts of her life, every smell she smelled, the sounds of her house at night, everything. Joan Wybury. Daughter of Alice Wybury. Alice married a lawyer, Joan's father. He wore a yellowing wig in court. He smelled of absinthe. His fingernails were cracked. He must have tugged at them or, or tapped them in court, maybe, so they kept cracking. Never had a chance to grow back clear. Joan was a hard-working girl. You know, you had to be in those days. She helped her mother with the washing. She swept the floors. She did the sewing and darning. She didn't cry her night her father first raped her because her mother was downstairs. She was afraid to disturb her. The poison. Morphine. Washed down with gin. To gin again? She threw most of it up. All she had left was gin, so she drank and drank. And slashed her arms. Both arms? The right arm first, then the left. Then her stomach. Then her throat. The throat wound was fatal. She was blind drunk by then. Her father was in a tavern. Her mother was with relatives. Her sisters? With a nurse. The nurse didn't stir. The nurse's name? Edith. The sisters? Alice, 12, Betty, 9. Joan was the middle one. I can taste the gin. I can smell his breath. I can see his fingernails. Steady. Steady. His breath, his hair, his tongue, his cracked yellow nails. Oh, I love this view. It's like Dickens. Carpet of white. It's bloody cold. I hardly notice it. I'm going in. Sandwich? I could see my own breath. Well, that's a good sign. <sighs> Her name was Evelyn. Go on. She was Welsh, South Welsh. Born in the year 1904 in Clenetley. More. Her father was a coal miner. Her mother took in knitting. When she was 11, her father, Garen, coughed himself to death. Pneumoconiosis. More. When she was 12, Evelyn came to London. She was in service. The family was called, um, Absalom. He was a goldsmith. She was raped? No. Murdered? No. A tragic suicide. <sighs> I'm sorry, I'm being awful. This is not the telly. I knew this woman. Understood. I'll be more tactful in future. Now, tell me about her. <sighs> All right. She was plain, puritanical. She had a sharp tongue, and by her own admission, not much of a sense of humour. Her first boyfriend jilted her. She went 12 years until her next boyfriend. She was 31. Her first baby died in childbirth. The second baby died in childbirth. The third baby survived and died when it was seven. Her own brother, George, had died the same year. E Evelyn came from a big family, eight sisters and four brothers. By the time she was 41, only two sisters were left. The rest were dead. She'd made a very good friend called How Rachel. How did she die? Let me... Continue. How did Evelyn die? I want to know. I need to know. I have no idea. I assume she must be dead by now. I knew her 20 years ago. 
and she was an old, old woman even then. But we lost touch. I, I simply don't know how she died. We went to the same supermarket. I, I used to help to carry her shopping. <laughs> she could total a bill in her head in ten seconds flat. Oh, she had no friends. All her family were dead. She still had that sharp, spiteful tongue. I loved her. I loved that old woman. The ghosts. Where are the ghosts in this story? She carried them on her. She had old, old skin with stiff grey wrinkles. And her eyes were... Oh, weary. I looked into her eyes and I saw her father coughing himself to death. I brushed her arm and I felt a child dying as it fell out of the womb. That old woman with a razor-sharp mind, she, she carried the ghost around her. People carry ghosts too. It's not just building, it's not just places. I don't find that sad. She was an old spiteful woman. She didn't love anyone. No one loved her. You'd like it more if she'd been hacked to death. Scary story. Turn on. Maybe. I love your stories. They shock me. Not stories. Real. Real ghosts. That's what that old woman lived with. Death in every pore, every cell. Ghosts smothering her. Imagine what that must be like. Imagine what that must be like. You wake up. You see the dead. You remember the dead, the stories the dead used to tell are with you, the pain, the boredom, every stupid incident of all their stupid, stupid lives. Less of the self-pity, Bob. I'm getting sick of it. Well, maybe I shouldn't tell any more ghost stories. Maybe we're both getting tired of them. Yeah, Judy? What do you think? No more ghost stories? Please? I might get sushi tomorrow. Please. And the challenge is to travel as far as I can without cheating before the dawn. So how far? How far did you get? Regent's Park. Well, from here? From here. I've done it before many times. Sneak up after work, wait until the sun goes down, then I begin. Up that fire escape? Down the next one. All the roads are interconnected. To cross the street, you get down to ground level, cross the road, go up the next fire escape. Oh, it's cheating, but it counts. Wow. It's a good night. Some walk. It's a way of seeing the world. Oh, will you take me? Of course, but not now. We only have 20 minutes. Oh, come on, let's make a start. Oh, hell. Are you OK? Vertigo. Think. <laughs> You're safe enough. The hoops will catch you if you fall. Oh, that's really put me at my ease. Boy! Watch out. You'll knock me off. You'll... Don't mind me, will you? Come and get me. I can't. I'm stuck. Come on. That's great. Now, don't stop. You're doing fine. There's a problem. Come on. The views are better up here. You can see the ball on the top of the Colosseum. No, I'm serious. I think that's St. Mary Lestrand. Well, of course it is. The Gibbs Spire. Come and see. Bob, I'm stuck. Oh, be stupid. Right, Bob. I'm going to fall. You can't fall. You're holding on. I'm not. I'm not. I'm letting go. I can see myself doing it. Letting go. Judy, don't let go. I'm going to fall. I'm going to die. You aren't going to die. You won't die. I'm falling. I'm falling. I can see it happening. I'm slipping through the wire hoops. I'm falling off the roof. OK, OK. So, so let's look at this rationally. You're afraid of heights, am I right? I'm afraid of hitting the ground at speed. I'm, I'm a gut spurting out like jam. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> Bob, stop it, please. I really can't help myself. Look. Look, look, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to fetch you, OK? I'm coming down the ladder. Here I am. Take my hand. Go away! Go away! You made me fall! OK, OK. I'm climbing back up the ladder. Hey, look, I'm on the roof now. I'm not crowding you. You're safe. Uh, I'll go for help. You can't. I won't be long. 
the only way down is past me. I'll go the other way, down to the ground, and back up to our building. But you can't leave me! You can't leave me alone or I'll fall! Uh, I think we have a situation here. so humiliated in all my life. You, you, you can't move your hand even a little bit. I'm scared! I've never been so scared. No, it's stupid. But I'm still scared. You have to come up here. Right away, Judy. Now! Move your hand! Move your hand or I'll jump to my death! Are you crazy? Yes, I am. Deranged, so do as I say or I'll kill myself. That's the deal. Climb, or I jump. Climb. Climb. Move your foot. Your hand. Your foot. Your hand. Your foot. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. That got your attention, didn't it? <laughs> it wasn't far. All I had to do was climb. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, you're safe now. Oh, Bob. Oh, Bob, you clown. I could almost love you sometimes. Don't talk. Just... That. I never saw her again. Ask me something else. OK. Eleven. Tell me about Eleven. I never lived Eleven. My sister was 16. She had cheesecloth shirts and jeans she shrank by sitting in the bath. She listened to pop music, the music you get in lifts now. But then it was like a revolution in your living room. She had boyfriends, so many boyfriends. She had lipstick, she had high heels, and she had sex. Lots of it. I didn't live Eleven when I was Eleven. I lived 16. Eight. The seaside, the taste of salt, ice cream, chips. Six. We had a holiday on a farm. I could smell cow shit all the time. The farmer's wife made us an omelette. Tell me about when your father died. That was 12. We were supposed to be going on holiday. Mum and Dad spent the morning quarrelling. We took the car to the garage to fill it up. We never came back. Mum was furious. You can't trust your father to do the simplest things, she kept saying. Then one of the neighbours came and said there'd been a car crash. When we went to look at it, it was our car. That was a real shock. It was empty and smashed up. But that was our car. I blew a metro. It hit a lamppost. Not very hard. He had a heart attack at the wheel. He was muttering under his breath as he died. If only I'd filled the car up last night. If only I'd filled the bloody car up. He was balding, that angular face. My father. Oh, we never talked about it. My mother, my sister and me. It was our secret. We must have thought, if we never mentioned it, no one would know it happened. We'd look like a normal family. So when people at school talked about my mum and dad, I never said, oh, sorry, my dad's dead. I should have said that. I wish I had. They've offered me a promotion. Yes? Yes. Will you take it? I'd be mad not to. Well, take it then. I shall. to dinner. I came home early. I had a headache. Sorry. Wash out, really. You? I walked the roads again. From here to City Wall. I didn't touch the ground once. Not once. One day you'll take me. St Paul's was that close. One day I'd like to climb the dome. Reach the lantern. One day. And 
what was her name? Jane Elliot. Jane Miranda Elliot. Her father's name was Claude. Her brother's name was... <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> we lived together. Bought furniture. Everything. She kept telling me I was too intense. I frightened her. And she thought I was boring. But when we went to bed, the earth moved. Good sex. The best. You're good at it. I'm great. So why did she leave you? Because of the sex. She couldn't cope. She was having orgasm flashes a week later. You're bragging again. Just stating a fact. So you'll have to show me sometime. How good you are. Against the rules. Bob. Don't pressure me. I want you. I want you so much. Bottle it up then. Feel the hurt. I don't want to. I want you to make love to me, Bob. I want you to love me. Will you, Bob? I'm making love to you now. No more games. Just do it. Close your eyes. And I'll close mine. Feel it. I'm making love to you. I'm inside you. Your body is shaking. You've never felt like this. It's... It's like dying. It's like flying. Your father? My father was a bus driver. He's still alive. My mother's dead. No brothers, no sisters. I have an uncle in Australia. When did your mother die? Ten years ago. How did you feel? Grief-stricken, of course. But what else? What else? Nothing. No guilt? No. You didn't feel you let her down? I wasn't interested in her approval. No guilt? How could you have no guilt? You jammy beggar. I ought to get back. Work beckons. I wouldn't cope. If it wasn't for our times together. Our lunch times. I'll see you tomorrow. Tonight? Tomorrow. Never tonight. You know that. Bob, before I go, tell me again. Tell me about the rooftops. My secret world. Tell me what it's like when you sleep on the roof and the dawn comes up over London. It's bliss. It's like... It's like watching life begin again. And the nets, the, the pigeon nets. You never see them till you know to look. Staked out across sheer drops. You can climb if you're quick, if you don't yank. You can hang there, high in the air. Clinging on by your fingertips. It's a wonderful feeling. The danger's such a buzz. And tell me. Tell me about the time you flew. Tell me, Bob. Tell me. Why did you do it? You were trapped there on the ladder, screaming you were stuck. And I shouted at you, hand, foot, hand, foot, hand, foot. And you reached the top and I held you. And we kissed for the first time. The only time. Why the hell did you jump? I thought it. And the thought was so vivid. I did it. Climb! Move your foot! Your hand! Your foot! Your hand! Your foot! <laughs> oh, no. oh no. Oh no. Oh no. That got your attention, didn't it? <laughs> it wasn't far. All I had to do was climb. It's okay. It's okay. You're safe now. Oh, Bob. Oh, Bob, you clown. I could almost love you sometimes. Don't talk. Just... Just kiss me. Bob? Now you're teasing me. I'm not afraid of falling. Not 
too close to the edge. I'm not afraid. I almost wonder. Not too close, Bob. I'm sorry. I sound like your mother. Not too close. What it would feel like. Bob, you're scaring me. Don't be afraid. I'm not. Mom! Mom! I'm busy saying Mom! Oh, Bob! This can't have happened! Come back! Oh, no! It's not warm, that's for sure. I love this view. I'll turn down the promotion. It's like Dickens. There's more to life than work. Mm. A carpet of white, but cold, so cold. You can feel it. <laughs> not really. I can see your breath. Not yours. Not mine. Bob, will you tell me about the ghosts? Please? Bob? <laughs> so I'm not consistent. Sue me. Today I'm in the mood, all right? So tell me about the ghosts. Oh, yes, I do. I want to hear. Tell me about him. Tell me about Matthew. But why? When? And how did Matthew die? Who found the body? Tell me. Tell me. In Gin and Rum by Philip Palmer, Judy was played by Caroline Katz and Bob by Philip Whitchurch. The director was Toby Swift.